Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to, to have you tonight at the Maison Francaise for a special event with uh, Peter Brooks. My name is uh, Claudie Bernard, and I'm a professor in the French department here at NYU, a specialist of the 19th century novel. So we will um, first hear, uh, after a short presentation, uh, we will hear Peter present his book. And uh, then I will ask him a few questions. And at the end of the session, uh, we will uh, answer questions from the audience. You can at any point uh, ask your question through the Q&A um, system, um, which uh, again, you can use uh, during the whole event. So welcome again. It is uh, of course an honor to have with us tonight uh, Peter Brooks who is Professor Emeritus at Yale University. Peter Brooks is one of the most prominent American scholars of 19th century French and English literature, a historian and a theoretician of the realist novel, a specialist of psychoanalytic theory as applied to literature. He's published many books, all reprinted many times and translated into many languages. And here I'll mention just a few of particular interest for the public of the Maison Francaise. And I'll start with the novel of worldliness published in 1969, in which Peter Brooks examines the interplay between the codes of mondanité and the individual experience in authors ranging from uh, Crébillon to Stendhal. The melodramatic imagination Yale University Press 1976, scrutinizes the influence of popular melodrama with, with its uh, Manichaean uh, hyper-significance, not only on romantic drama, but on the moral expressionism of Balzac and on the inner consciousness of Henry James characters. Reading for the plot, published first in 1984 and then republished by Harvard in 92, uses and distances itself from both narratology and psychoanalysis to elucidate how the temporal sequence of a story progresses towards meaning and the satisfaction of the reader's desire with references to uh, Balzac, Stendhal, Conrad, Faulkner, and others. Realist Vision, Yale University Press 2005, interrogates our thirst for reality, something uh, Brooks says that we should rather be tired of in our everyday lives, and authors for the vicarious experiences of this reality through literature and the visual arts, as for instance, in the works of uh, Balzac, the inventor of the 19th century, Manet, Caillebot, Joyce, Virginia Woolf, and many more. More recently, Peter Brooks' essays like his uh, Henry James Goes to Paris, published in 2007, are in a slightly different vein, less um, academic, although no less erudite, and addressed to a larger public. Let's not forget that Brooks is himself a novelist, more specifically a historical novelist, author of World Elsewhere, Simon and Schuster, 1999, and The Emperor's Body, Norton, 2011, adventure stories set respectively in pre-revolutionary and in post-Napoleonic France. Flaubert in the Ruins of Paris, published uh, recently in 2017, is based on a study of the correspondence between Flaubert and Georges Sand during the terrible year 1870-71. And it is part biography, part history, illustrated by striking photographs, and part literary criticism. And all these approaches converge to present a Flaubert less reactionary than generally admitted, and to detect in his picture of the 48th insurrection in sentimental education, a 
prescience of the Paris Commune. Peter Fuchs has also edited many works, and most importantly for us today, Balzac's human comedy selected story. Uh, this was with the, the New York Review Books in 2014. His uh, Balzac's Lives, just published also by New York Review Books, which he will present to us tonight, is in a sense a crowning of his career as a Balzacian scholar and editor, as well as a kind of novelistic endeavor for while immensely informative and illuminating, it reads like a multifaceted story. Balzac's Lives, this title is deliberately ambiguous. We will be dealing with the life or lives of Balzac, who, although he died at age 50, had a very full and diverse existence. Or perhaps with Balzac's afterlife, the cultural myths he elicited. When we open the book, we realize that it is about the lives, plural, even innumerable, of the characters he created. And yet, you call your book an anti-biography, or rather an oblique biography of Balzac. So are the characters' lives an extension of, a sublimation of, a compensation for Balzac's hopes and failures? You will speak more about this title, the genesis of the book, what you intend to do with it now. Thank you very much, Claudie. And thanks also to, to Fran Francoise, Francine and the Maison Francaise for, for inviting me. Can you all see me and hear me properly? Good. Um, so uh, following up from what Claudie said in that generous introduction, I've wanted to write a book about Balzac, I think for some 30 years or so. I've done short pieces on him. I've edited uh, some of his work. Um, but I thought it was time to finally take on the great man himself. But how to do it? I mean, the human comedy is so vast, over 90 novels and stories, if you take it all together. Um, and how do you get a grasp on it? Uh, how to make sense of it, especially for an American public? Uh, I have a feeling that Balzac is sort of disappeared from the American horizon. He once was on it. You know, if you go back to 1900, every educated American family had a complete edition of the uh, human comedy as translated by this incredible woman, Catherine Prescott Wormley, who sat in Jackson, New Hampshire, and just worked her way through the human comedy. But now I think he's fallen from the American consciousness how to restore him there. Uh, so that was the first problem. The second problem is that I have a feeling that no one's much interested in, in literary criticism anymore. Um, at the time I was in college, um, literary criticism was kind of a living thing. People uh, read, of it, read it and, and its cultural commentary seemed to, to matter. If you think of people like Lionel Trilling or Edmund Wilson or I.A. Richards or even F.R. Uh, Leavis, and that's changed. No one, um, no one reads literary criticism for fun anymore, right? Um, so how to do it? And I think one way to do it, attempt to do it, as I, as I was doing in the Henry James Goes to Paris and in um, the Flaubert book uh, that Claudie mentioned, um, Flaubert on the Ruins of Paris, was to try to make study of literary texts part of a story of how they came to be, of their place in history, and their, their, how they were read and their resonance in the world. So thinking about Balzac, one obvious way to do it would have been to, uh, to present a, a biography. Um, but there are already good biographies of Balzac, including one very good one in English, the Graham Robb. And anyway, biographies never seem to me a way to, the way to get at what's truly remarkable um, about uh, the creative process. Um, it seems to me it, it tends to move from sublime results to trivial causes. Um, and in fact, 
to be honest, I detest most literary biography. So um, it seems to be a way to tame and make anodyne what's most interesting and remarkable and challenging in, in art and literature. So another biography of Balzac um, wouldn't do it. So then the idea came to me, why not write biographies, not of Balzac himself, but of his characters, of the fictional lives uh, he created. According to the dictionaries that have been um, compiled by, by modern scholars of Balzac, there are over 2,400 fictional persons in his work. I think that even beats Shakespeare. Um, it's, it's just an extraordinary creation of imaginative life. Uh, and it seems to me that it's in these invented people in their origins, their careers, their ambitions, their loves, their successes and failures, especially in the way they interact that we get the, the panorama of life as it was lived at a moment, a very rapid social uh, transformation in the wake of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic epic that followed it. Balzac presents the dynamics of a society that's caught up in early capitalist development, where the systems of social cohesion have been lost, where everything seems to be up for grabs, where individual ambition may lead you to fortune, um, but at the same time may lay bare the, the, the shredding of the, of the social fabric. And I think it's, it's, it's these concerns that come out in the characters that may mean, lead us not so much to Balzac's biography, but to his inner life, uh, his obsessions and uh, his projection of himself onto the world. Balzac's ambitious young men, and there's some women too, uh, seem to be to remain extraordinarily alive to us and close to us because they, they, they continue to ask, who are we individually and as a collectivity? How do you know who people are and what you expect of them? How to evaluate them in this new social order where in Balzac's time, everyone, meaning all men, were black where the clear signs of social distinction of the old regime seem to have vanished. The vertiginous new freedoms and opportunities for self-definition for the self-made man that come along uh, in this new world, but in Balzac's view, at tremendous cost. Individualism reigns and it's very exciting, but the result is a kind of unstable social order. I think the great question in Balzac's world becomes, who are you? What can I know about you? How can I know if I trust you, right? These are questions that come back over and over in different forms. And Balzac found a, 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 a very new way to address these questions in his creation of returning characters, le retour des personnages, as the French say, when the same characters come back from novel to novel in, in, in different roles, sometimes in a major role, sometimes in a mere cameo appearance. And that helps him create a world, recalling stories of characters' lives from other novels, not in any systematic way. As he says, life is a mosaic. And we may see someone first in middle age, then get this story of his youth later. For instance, we encounter a staid, respectable husband in one novel and later learn of his tempestuous and tragic first love and youth and so on. And with, it, with these returning characters, Balzac's world begins to get very crowded. You enter a salon in one novel and you rub elbows with many old acquaintances. More and more, you don't need the outside world, outside reality, because this world becomes a totality in itself. A real poet such as Alphonse de Lamartine, for instance, is sort of pushed out in, progressively and his place taken by the fictional poet uh, Melchior de Canalis. Oscar Wilde once wrote in one of his lovely paradoxes, the only real people are the people who never existed. And I think there's a lot of that in Balzac. They are realer to us than real. But obviously I couldn't, I couldn't recount the lives of all Balzac's uh, fictional persons, not even all the important ones. So after much thought and, and selectivity, I chose nine who I thought would be broadly representative. And these pull, of course, in others as lovers, friends, antagonists, co-workers, or whatever. And I told their lives as they come to us in the novels, trying to suggest how 
reading of a single novel creates an appetite for more. And I think that's a very primary experience of reading Balzac, the need for more, the need to find out what happens to central people such as Eugène de Rastignac or the Vicomtesse de Beauceon or the criminal mastermind whom we're, we always meet in disguise, Vautrin, alias Jacques Collin, alias the Reverend Carlos Herrera, alias Cheat Death. And I think really Balzac in this manner creates a new form of reading that we now know mainly through the TV serial, a form that Balzac would have loved um, had he known it. I think the closest contemporary analog to the human comedy is something like Game of Thrones. But Balzac's serial doesn't take place in some invented mythic past, but in the here and now, in modern French society. And by that, I mean, of course, French society of 1820s, 30s, and 40s. But Balzac's modernity, what was modern for him, seems to me very analogous to what is modern for us. His diagnosis of society and where it, it is headed has been largely confirmed since. He declared himself a bit theatrically a conservative Catholic and monarchist. But of course, he's always been appreciated most by the other side, especially by the Marxists, starting with, with Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels themselves. His critique of modern society from what he sees as a, a right wing fringe aligns him most of all with those on the left who think that the world needs to be changed utterly. Balzac condemns the unbridled ambition and the cash nexus that seems to have become the sole measure of, of success and power in his world. Uh, replacing an old regime valuation of landholding and of course his nostalgia for uh, an old regime where everything had its place, where everything was ordered, um, uh, has, has a bit of fake in it, right? Like most nostalgia. Um, but at the same time, he's fascinated by what he condemns. He's full of sympathy for these restless young men and women who are seeking something new, who want to conquer the world, not only for its riches, but also in search of new experience to see where their demonic energy can lead them. In art and invention and love and sex as well, Balzac, Balzac takes us to the further shores of experience and experiment. And I'll just end on this line. Uh, it seems to me he was extraordinarily bold in seeking truth in extreme forms of human experience. He exploded lies and hypocrisy, and that alone makes him bracingly relevant in our current situation. Thanks. And now I want to hear Claudie's questions and all of your questions. Okay, so um, I'll start by quoting uh, you. I've talked about Balzac's characters as if they were real people, you insist, substantial enough to be points of reference in our understanding of the world, including, of course, its inhabitants and, and ourselves. Um, and of course, um, you uh, recognize that uh, this is an illusion. Yet you claim with Proust that the character's very fictionality makes them better cognitive instruments than real people. So I was wondering if you could uh, explain to us this privilege of fictionality. Oh, that's, that's a really interesting um, and, and difficult question. I mean, I think it's an amazing thing, our devotion to people who never existed, right? People we read about in fictions. They can be more important to us than uh, real people at times. Why? I mean, what are we working out through them um, in this kind of imagined dialogue that we carry on with a Balzac character or a Jane Austen character, or whatever? And as as you as you noted, Proust says that suppressing real people in in favor of imaginary people allows us to enter their minds and uh, emotions uh, in a way we can't with real people. Real people, he says, are opaque to us. But if you abolish real people in, fa in favor of, of, of fictional people, there's a certain transparency that results. And we begin to see the world through the eyes of these fictional people. Um, we can make their, 
their inner lives are own and live within through them. I mean, it's a kind of incarnation of what or, or what Proust uh, likes to call in, in a very recondite word metempsychosis, I think. Yes, and, and there are of course dangers uh, with that. I mean, we all remember um, Madame Bovary, uh, you know, who went a little too far. But, um, but yes, the privilege of fictionality. Um, and uh, you also insist, uh, and, and you reminded, uh, you reminded um, us uh, that uh, in your, uh, you insist, uh, on the importance of the assertion, the modern assertion of the individual uh, at the time of Balzac, that is in post-revolutionary Europe, uh, Western Europe, um, you um, demonstrate that uh, individuals were not particularly uh, privileged, uh, decide to take charge of uh, their own lives and are anxious to have a say in their history. Uh, and yet in this new regime where all individuals are in theory equal, you mentioned the famous black bourgeois uniform, uh, there's a, a ferocious competition and, and hence the necessity and the difficulty of assert one's own identity. Uh, Rastignac, succeeds, Lucien de Rubempré fails. So how would you say Balzac builds and helps us elucidate the enigma of identity to, to paraphrase the title of one of your books? Uh, yeah, enigma of identity. Uh, you know, Vautrin describes the life of an ambitious man, a uh, young man like, uh, a thousand spiders in a teapot, right? Um, uh, fighting it out for a struggle for existence. And there's a great deal of that in, in, in Balzac. And I think, as I said before, the big question um, for these young people, particularly affronting Paris for the first time, and that is a very common situation in Balzac, is, is who are you? How do I know who you are? How do I know if I can trust you? the clear social hierarchies of the old regime have been swept away and everything's up for grabs. And that gives on the one hand, great opportunities for the ambitious such as Rastignac to fashion himself as what he wants to become. But it also cre creates uh, great uncertainties about the people you meet. How do you know who the person living next to you in the Pension Volcano really is? Is he a businessman, uh, or is he disguised? Uh, you know, is he a disguised convict, um, or perhaps more significantly, is someone like the Baron de Nucingen the representative of uh, an emerging form of capitalist finance, or is he a crook? And in fact, in Nucingen's case, he's both. Right? And so in some ways you have, to, you have to trust him, you have to work with him, but you have to you know, cover your back also. These are dangerous times. Uh, and these are all in a sense, I suppose, buildings, Roman, um, for women as well as men. But if you look at them as novels of education and progress in the world, there's a significant, uh, significant percentage of failure, right? Of people who fail to arrive at their goal. Um, I think the structure of society is such that um, many educations are gonna fail to achieve what they want to achieve. Don't know if that answers your question. But Absolutely. And so um, what about women in uh, this yes. uh, human comedy? You mentioned quite a few. Uh, some belong to the aristocracy, like La Duchesse de Langer, others to the provincial, provincial gentry, uh, Henriette de Morsoff. Uh, we have uh, wives of uh, Parvenu, Delphine de Nucingen, or, or also the, the demi mondaine, uh, Esther Gobseck, and, and prostitutes. So, uh, what are their chances? Um, it can they assert their individuality? What is uh, what is their role in the human comedy? Uh, another good question. Let me let me let me start maybe with uh, Esther, the most remarkable Esther uh, 
uh, Gobsek, who who is the most spectacular of the courtesan, the sort of high class prostitutes. Um, there's a wonderful description by the journalist Etienne Lousteau, who says of her, because of her profession, she's known men from every social stratum. And she knows them by unleashing their desires. There's this image of, of Circe who turns men into, into swine, right? Uh, she knows how to um, get to them by unleashing their sexual desires. And in a sense, she's sort of a strange figure of the novelist himself. She gets at, um, she gets at what's sort of uh, uh, essential in men and in this masculinist society uh, through desire and through sex. But of course, um, even though she turns the tables on them in some ways, she's very limited and uh, ends up being sacrificed to uh, uh, Jacques Collin's plots for Lucien de Lompre and commits suicide after she sold a Nussingen. And you have the feeling that the aristocratic women and even some of the bourgeois women um, have a little bit more freedom, but it generally turns out to be false. I mean, even if you take the cream of society in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, someone like, say, the Princesse de Cadignan, who seems to be above the fray and in fact keeps a, a, an album where she has portraits of her all all her very numerous former lovers and seems to have that kind of freedom of maneuver even she you discover when she wants you know when she wants to um start a real relationship with daniel d'artes she has to hide her past from him right uh and and, and make out that she's a figure of total uh, purity and restraint um, so is there any woman in, in the Comédie of Men who is, who is truly free? The only one I can think of is um, Hélène d'Aiglemont, who runs off with a pirate. And she, enjoy, she enjoys a very free life for a yeah, while. But she, she, she finishes comes, badly. Comes to a bad end also. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I think it's one of the, the notable things about Balzac, and it's one of the reasons he was so popular among women readers, was that he did somehow get into the women's condition and understand it almost from inside. There's a certain androgynous quality to, to Balzac. Um, and uh, women wrote to him uh, all the time saying that they recognized their own condition mm -hmm. in the condition of the women that he had portrayed. So it's, an, it's a really interesting part of the comedy of men and very difficult to talk about because it, he's not a feminist, but um, there are things that he, he understands. Yeah, and in a sense, I mean, some of his heroines are, you know, kind of conventional and pale, but he has some, like, I'm thinking of La Cousine Bette, who right. is yes. an incredible force, right. uh, a dark force. And uh, because also she's marginalized, what is a cousine. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, so women, there would be volumes to, yeah. And, and then, like Cousin Bet, you have that remarkable couple of women. I mean, Bet and Madame Martinet, and together uh -huh. they yes. create total havoc. Yes. yes. Destroy a whole family. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, 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 so, in, in, in the Comedy of Men, we find uh, a lot of uh, groups associations, and you mentioned uh, Le Cénacle, Les Treize, uh, uh, the, 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 the convicts, and many more, but um, we rarely see crowds like we do in, in, in Flaubert, uh, L'Education Sentimentale, of course, in Zola, uh, perhaps after the, the 48 revolution, crowds, uh, of course, become uh, more uh, threatening. Uh, but um, how do you explain this relative absence of crowds in, in, in Balzac? Yeah, there was a revolution, you know, the French well, Revolution. Yeah, no, interesting. I, I think that Balzac really was not much interested in the, in the proletariat, which is, you know, the, the sort of source of the crowd in Zola very often. Um, there is one famous description of the Parisian crowd in, in Balzac, and that's at the beginning of The Girl with the Golden Eyes, La Fille aux yeux d'or, um, where he talks about the 
Paris population and coming back from work and how they're all uh, motivated by gold and pleasure. And uh, they all look terrible and fatigued and so on. But I, I, I think you're right that it's really only with Zola that you get true crowd scenes. Um, it's really the, the aspiring and bourgeois aspiring bourgeoisie and the aristocracy that interest Balzac most of all. But come to think of it, there is one amazing crowd scene um, in Illusion Perdue, Lost Illusions, when uh, Lucien, who's been um, cast away by Madame de Barcheton and her friend Madame d'Espel, goes out on the Champs-Élysées one afternoon, and there are three or four thousand Balzac says, that must be right, three or 4,000 carriages of the upper class that are out uh, crowding the Champs-Élysées. And that's the kind of a crowd, but a crowd of, of the other sort, of, of the rich uh, and, and, well, and, and well off. And of course, they refuse to even recognize Lucien, who is completely cut out of this world. But think of it, three or 4,000 carriages on the Champs-Élysées, Champs that must have been quite a spectacle. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, you, you mentioned also that Balzac was not, you know, uh, uh, he, he, he was not a leftist. Uh, he was, well, his ideology is uh, evolved and is not always easy to pinpoint. And certainly his uh, novelistic practice often uh, goes against what his ideological uh, uh, credos uh, proclaim. Um, the, I, I wanted to ask you about something that, uh, I mean, a, a, a topic that has uh, uh, elicited a lot of attention, and it is the question of uh, patriarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, th there are many father figures in, in the human comedy, uh, Vautrin, Papa Gobsec, Père Grandé, uh, Le Père Prodigue uh, in La Cousine Bête, and, 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 and some, um, like uh, Vautrin, uh, can, uh, are able to probe hearts and, and minds and like to play the role of uh, fate. Uh, others, on the other hand, uh, Père Gorio, Hulot, and so forth, are deficient and defeated. So I was wondering if you could say a word about this father figures and explain how some, in your opinion, offer perhaps a metaphor for the author creator of this microcosm that you described, the, the human comedy. Yeah, no, I, it's a, that's a big question in the human comedy. Um, you make me think of, of a letter that Lucien de Rubempré in Lost Illusions writes just, just shortly before he's going to commit suicide, a suicide he never does commit. But anyway, not there anyway. Um, and, he, and he describes um, a family in which the daughter is malade de son père. She's sick because of her father and never marries. And then this is generalized and I think Balzac felt that all of France was malade de son père, meaning sick from the execution of the, of the big father, the king, uh, Louis says in, in 1793, and that France has really never recovered a principle of authority since then. Of course, there was Napoleon, and um, Napoleon is the person that no Frenchman has ever been able to get over, right? And certainly not Balzac. Uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, he, Napoleon was an usurper. And so the, the, the principle of legitimate authority isn't there anymore. And that seems to have repercussions all through society and, and, and with individuals. Um, there are lots of fathers in the novel and they ought to, in the novels, and they ought to represent authority, discipline, and tradition. And sometimes they try to um, think of old Goriot, Pierre Goriot on his deathbed. Uh, it's all a rant about how paternity is being trampled underfoot and marriage has become prostitution and a barter, barter. And it's essentially saying that a corrupt cash nexus has taken over all of society and any, any, any sort of vertical principle of authority has been uh, undermined. Um, and I think other, other 
fathers in the human comedy try to exercise authority and Vautrin, as you said, comes closer than most to, to making it work, not with Rastignac, but later with, with Lucien, though even that, that uh, son um, escapes him and uh, Baron Hulot, whom we were just talking about, destroys a whole family because he's a, a père prodigue. I think, it's a, I think it's a figure of a social problem, but I think it's also, uh, as you say, a figure of the father novelist faced with a kind of a perpetual insurrection of his characters, um, which, he, which he kind of enjoys. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it, is, it is telling that the, the human comedy is unfinished as opposed to uh, Les Rougon Macquart, you know, that's a, a, right. a common uh, comparison. Uh, Les Rougon Macquart, you know, planned from the beginning, the 20 volumes and, you know, uh, uh, covering uh, a section of time, which is uh, well defined. Uh, whereas the, the, the human comedy, in a sense, uh, as, you know, was planned uh, in uh, as a pyramid and never was, you know, uh, uh, never uh, actually even, I think, Balzac never even uh, probably really believed in, in it. So could you, uh, could, could you comment on, 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 on the state of this human comedy? You know, you mentioned the, uh, that it is a mosaic, I think, uh, uh, indeed, uh, and the mosaic is still uh, imperfect, you know, it's full of holes. Can you comment on that? Yes, we, the, the human comedy was, in, was invented as Balzac went along. And uh, you know, it's well known that it was when he was writing uh, Père Goriot in 1834, that he originally had named his hero uh, Massiac, and then he crossed out Massiac and he put in the name Rastignac, which is the name of someone he'd already used in the fatal skin, La Peau de Chagrin. And that began the invention of the returning characters in an attempt to link all his novels together. But it was not, it was not laid out in advance the way Zola's Hugan Maca was, or uh, you know, John Galsworthy's uh, The Foresight Saga. It, it was invented along the way, and he was always trying to fill gaps. I mean, Balzac, as we all know, is one of the most disorganized creators ever. Um, he was always, <laughs> He was always in debt. He was always owing further installments to at least one and sometimes more than one publisher. And uh, he would, um, when he would get an advance for something, he would spend it um, on something else and, and paying off his debtors or, or buying his beautiful jewel encrusted cane that became so famous in Paris. So it, it's a chaotic creation. But then by 1842, he writes the Avant Propos, the general introduction to the human comedy, which is in a sense a kind of um, advertising flyer, a prospectus for the work to come. And he says that uh, he's planning 101 texts. Uh, he didn't get to them all. Um, had he lived another 10 years, he, he might have. I mean, it's an absolutely extraordinary uh, accomplishment. The, these 90 texts in a matter of 20 years, really, from from. 1830 to his, to his death in, in 1850. But you're right, it's, it's never completed and, and probably never could have been com completed. And again, that's one of the experiences of Balzac. There's always room for more, right? Um, and there's always something more to be said. And if you look at Balzac's mm -hmm. proofs, um, it's one reason he was always in debt. Uh, he would add, you know, uh, he would put great bubbles in the margins and add more <laughs> because there's always more to be said. Yes. I, I, was, I was recently um, interested in his novel about the election, um, uh, Le Député d'Arcisse, and um, a novel he never finished. But while he was writing it, he decided he had to fill in the background of some of the characters. So he, he stopped ready, he put it aside and wrote a murky business, Une tenet vos affaires, which is a full length novel just to fill in the background and, and a marvelous novel that, that fills in the background of the, of the first novel he'd been working on. Amazing. Uh, thank you. Uh, so um, you, uh, 
explain that in Balzac's world, the characters and the narrator are constantly deciphering signs for us. Um, everything's a sign, the, the Paris, uh, you, uh, you insist that uh, on its, uh, uh, you insist on the semiotics of urban life, but you know, people are um, enigmas, as we said, costumes, physiognomies, uh, all these uh, elements have to be uh, deciphered and you, um, you explain that um, sometimes also they have to be deciphered through a kind of a second view, you know, Facino can be able to see gold through the walls, just like the narrator of that story is able to enter the minds of the uh, simple people he, he follows in the street. So I'd like to speak about uh, what you call Balzac's epistemophilia, uh, this desire to know and to uh, decipher his hermeneutics too. And, and also about the fact that it might easily verge uh, on madness. The verge on, sorry? Madness. Madness, yes. The, as you know, uh, uh, the mystical philosopher Louis Lambert, uh, the al chemist, alchemist, uh, Balthazar Claes, the painter Frenhofer, all uh, want to reach a certain truth, not only fall short, but fall into a kind of madness. Uh, uh, absolutely, yeah. Well, to start with epistemophilia, uh, as I understand the term, it's a term I, I borrow from James Strachey, who was translating Freud's term, this uh, the drive for knowledge. And as I understand it, it's a sexualized drive to know. Originally, the child's desire to learn about sex, about sexual difference and where babies come from and so on. But then later on becomes a more eroticized drive to know. And Freud says that for intellectuals, for people like us, thinking itself becomes sexualized, right? Eros is invested in the search for knowledge itself. So I think this kind of drive to know, eroticized drive to know, is very characteristic of a lot of Balzac's um, searchers, right? Uh, who are all also overreachers. Uh, Claes, for instance, who is searching for the absolute, uh, the sort of basic unit of all creation, or Frenhofer, whom you mentioned in um, The Unknown Masterpiece, who wants to paint the perfect picture of the perfect woman and destroys his canvas. He overlays it with uh, an illegible uh, layer of paint. Um, and, and, and others, uh, including the Balzacian narrator himself, who's always trying to penetrate appearances to get at what lies behind, what really explains what's going on. That's why he has his philosophical works as well as his studies of manners. He wants to know the principles that make everything run, right? Um, what's driving it? And at times he, he, he seems a little bit like Frenhofer or perhaps more like his fictional philosopher, Louis Lambert, who goes totally mad, um, and only only one person in the world can understand what he's saying, right? So um, it's this this drive to get beyond effects to causes, I think. Um, yes, and 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 I think Balzac feared madness. He feared that somehow he was creating too much, and he might be punished for it. Well, there's always a, a risk of encroaching upon the creator's, uh, you know, privilege in, in yeah. uh, novelistic characters. Um, on another note, um, you, uh, 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 well, the human comedy, the sen scenes of, of private life, military life, country life, and so forth, uh, Balzac uses uh, theatrical uh, vocabulary, like his contemporaries, he was very, uh, very much influenced by the stage and by its codes. And of course, you have demonstrated the importance of melodrama on his oeuvre. So um, what does this theatrical dimension bring to, to Balzac's narrative writing? And, and what impact does it have on our reading? 
Well, I think, yeah, as I, I've, I've, I've claimed for many years that it, it, Balzac uses a melodramatic mode of representation that's very effective. Of course, he, he um, everyone at that time was fascinated by the theater. The theater had tremendous social prestige. It was the way you could make your, your name uh, become famous most quickly. Um, and he did write for the theater as well as novels, not with a great deal of success. Well, Vautrin would have been a success except the censors banned it after, after one night. Um, uh, I think melodrama is a way to heighten uh, the issues of life, right? To bring out the essential moral dilemmas uh, and human relations that we all deal with. It's maybe it's a kind of hyper-realism, an, an over-the-top realism. Um, and I think one reason we are able to appreciate Balzac again is that our, in our postmodern or maybe post postmodern, whatever our moment is, a uh, culture, uh, we can appreciate that once again. We've gotten beyond the sort of restraint and minimalism of early modernism. And once again, we can appreciate this kind of over the top technique. Um, Balzac's theatricality makes the world comprehensible. It also makes it more fun, I think. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Um, perhaps uh, one or two more questions before we open the floor. Um, a question about the the press, because uh, as you know, of course, uh, uh, Balzac was a journalist. Uh, most of his novels appeared as feuilleton in newspapers and in Lost Illusions. We have to, to swallow you know, pages and pages about paper making and the, the machinery of the, the printing uh, um, uh, pre the, 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 the press and he is interested in the uh, morals of the journalists. So the venality and the versatility of their language. Um, so could you uh, tell us a few words about what you call the capitalization of the spirit, which the press is linked to, and about this uh, literature industrielle, uh, which saint Beuve famously um, criticized and which Balzac, in a sense, practices. Yes, I mean, uh, saint Beuve criticized what he called industrial literature, meaning mainly the serialized novel in the daily newspaper. And he thought it led to, you know, writing for money and, and, and a certain sloppiness in, in writing. Uh, and really what saint Beuve is, is criticizing, I think, is what you might call the democratization of, of literature. And though Balzac is no Democrat, he very much participates in that democratization of literature. And um, he, he deplores it on the one hand in uh, uh, Lost Illusions. I mean, it's about the poet losing his innocence as a poet and becoming a corrupt journalist. Um, this is a deplorable situation, but it's also very exciting and it's, and it's a new world. Um, Balzac really disliked the snobbery of, of, of saint Beuve, right? Who was um, against reaching a, a large public, for instance. Balzac was actually the first French novelist to publish a serial novel in, in 1836. Um, though uh, he never could entirely adapt to the form because his writing was too chaotic. And um, he, was, he wasn't as good as Eugène Sue, for instance, the author of The Mysteries of Paris, at making every episode end with a cliffhanger and so on. And he was frustrated by that. He, uh, in, the, in the 1840s, you can see him rivaling with Eugène Sue. Uh, so I think his, his relation to industrial literature is, is ambivalent. He, he in some ways deplores it, but he knows you have to live with it. He doesn't opt out, for instance, the way Flaubert will opt out of um, that kind of industrialization of literature. Yet he doesn't become completely its creature, the way you might say Eugène Sue or Alexandre Dumas do. Um, and they, they really um, uh, can be very unstylish for, for pages at a time and, 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 and write a lot of filler dialogue, for instance. So I think his art is a kind of balancing act really between the popular and the highbrow. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, answering all these questions. And of course, our uh, viewers have also uh, a lot. Uh, it will be very difficult to pick. 
I would like to start with uh, a question that comes from overseas, uh, from Rachel Bowlby, and, uh, uh, and I will read it. Uh, it strikes me that over the years, Peter's writing style has undergone several changes, all the way from the undramatic prose of the melodramatic imagination to the sharp theoretical studies of reading for the plot, to the descriptive power of the novels, to the page turning pulse of Balzac's life. And uh, this brings us back to your uh, words at the, the beginning of this section, where you explained why you uh, wrote this book. And the question is, have you changed? And also has academic writing changed? And uh, I think, uh, uh, yes, I would be uh, particularly interested if you could answer the two, um, uh, the first one and the second one. Well, I, I, I'm really flattered that if the page treating uh, uh, pulse of Balzac's lives is, <laughs> is just that, and, and, and uh, no, I, I really am pleased. I, I think it's a challenge for all of us is how to reach a public. I mean, when I, when I got my PhD eons ago, um, one tended to write in a certain academic style, um, which was accepted at the time, sort of uh, maybe a little bit complicated and gentlemanly. And I've got nothing against complication in writing, but uh, after all, we want to be read. And I think that um, trying to you don't know where the public is anymore. And so you have to try and create it in the way you write. Um, I don't know whether I can really do that or not, but I think that's a challenge that anyone who is interested in talking about literature has to face at the moment. It's not, it's not a given, um, you know, um, you have to fight for an audience. Yes, and here I have a question from uh, some, um, anonymous attendee who asks, reading the entire human comedy is a daunting ambition. If one is only going to read a few Balzac novels, which ones do you suggest? So obviously you've picked nine characters, but which novels would you suggest? Okay, let me preface that by saying that one of the reasons that Balzac isn't more read, I think, in, in, in America is that some of the translations are very old and not sort of in current taste. Uh, there's some, uh, there are some terrific new translations. I would say, you know, um, everyone should read Pierre Goyo, and, and that is the one that people in this country very often have read. Um, I think Lost Illusions, which actually is in a, in a very good translation by Kathleen Rain in, in Modern Library, is sort of at the heart of um, the, the human comedy. Its successor novel, uh, as, as published by Penguin, has the pretty ghastly title of A Harlot High and Low, Splendor et Misère des Courtisans. But I, I'm happy to say that uh, Edwin Frank at New York Review of Books has commissioned a new translation by, by Jordan Stump, a very fine translator of Balzac. He did some of the short stories in the collection I edited that you mentioned. Um, so that eventually would be a long, a much better one. And then a few of the, the, the things that are less well known. Um, I love A Murky Business, in Tenebro's Affair, which has the absolutely most glorious of all Balzacians, uh, of all Balzac's heroines. Uh, Laurence de Saint-Signe, uh, marvelous, uh, very, very, very fun and heroic novel. Um, and then some of the short pieces, I mean, things like um, the unknown masterpiece is quite well known. And that, that also exists in, in a, a modern translation by Richard Howard. But then things like um, A Passion in the Desert about uh, a French soldier who gets lost during Napoleon's Egyptian campaign and falls in love with a panther. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but basically that's the story. Um, or um, the Duchess of Langeais, La Duchesse de Langeais, of which Jacques Rivette uh, made a film of it not that long ago, what, about 10 years ago? 
uh, which I thought was very disappointing. I mean, it was kind of flat, whereas the story is highly erotic and, and passionate. Mm -hmm. So those were, those would be some that I would recommend uh, starting with. And I have a question here that um, follows nicely. Um, have Balzac novels or stories been made into movies, operas, or other arts? And the answer is obviously yes. And you uh, started, you mentioned a few. Um, yeah, no, well, what, yeah, one of my frustrations is that some of these things I haven't been able to get hold of. There was a famous adaptation of uh, The Girl with the Golden Eyes, La Fille aux yeux d'or, with, with Marie Laforêt playing the fille. Um, um, and I have not, I mean, I've asked my, my friend Dudley Andrew, who's a great expert in French cinema, but he hasn't been able to find it for me. Um, he, did, he did show me uh, a few years ago a marvelous film made, I think during the occupation or just after, uh, called Vautrin, um, which uh, sort of combines the, the matter of lost illusions and a heart of high and low. And if you ever get a chance to see that, um, it's an old black and white film from the 1940s. Um, it's, it's absolutely marvelous. Um, that's very good. Um, so there are a lot of uh, filming, uh, filmic adaptations out there. There are television adaptations as well. It's just that uh, sitting here in America, it's kind of hard to get hold of them. And then if you manage to get a, get a DVD, it won't play on your machine. So <laughs> you need to have an adapter or something. Yeah. So another question, um, Balzac is usually considered a realist writer. So why um, is there the presence of so many fantastic features? Uh, for example, of course, uh, wild ass can. Uh, and why, uh, and this man, um, Mr. George O'Brien, uh, asked also why this focus on the Arabian night tales? Uh, indeed, the fantastic element, you, you speak about it in your book, you know, you have Raphael de Valentin as one of the nine characters. Uh, yes, this is sometimes uh, surprising in Balzac's. I know, I mean, uh, The Arabian Nights uh, absolutely is Balzac's favorite book, and it comes up again and again. And uh, The Fatal Skin, La Peau de Chagrin, which you mentioned, where Raphael de Valentin is the hero, is a very good example. I mean, he he obtains a, a, a magic talisman, and the magic talisman serves for Balzac to reveal the sort of whole course of life, right? That uh, uh, the more you desire and obtain the objects of your desire, the shorter your life becomes, right? And uh, I also mentioned in the book that uh, at the very end of his life, the day before he called for his doctor to give him a lethal injection. Freud read that novel. He, he had it in his library, but he hadn't read it before. And when he finished, he said, this was the perfect last reading. It's all about the end, right? About shrinkage and starvation. So I think, you know, don't imprison Balzac in the terms of realism. And after all, realism is a word that comes into being to characterize art and literature only at the very end of Balzac's life. Uh, it's really in 1850, it's applied to Cour the painter right. Courbet's work, right? Yeah. So he's only retrospectively characterized as, as, a, as, as a realist. And he is a realist, but his real is demonic. It's inhabited by these forces of energy and he wants to get to those. Yes, and in a sense it's epistemophilia is also directed towards Absolutely. all these occult forces that are there in the world a little like electricity and that need, need to be uh, accounted for. So yes. Um, Balzac was interested in all the sciences of his time, but also all the pseudosciences of his time, like mesmerism and so on. Yeah. Yes, and at the time they were not so strictly exactly. uh, compartmented Right. today. Right. Uh, uh, um, um, an attendee um, uh, says that um, a critic, I can't recall who, 
called Balzac the French Dickens, and Dickens the English Balzac. Would you agree? And how would you compare the two? Uh, I wouldn't entirely agree. I mean, I, I can see why people say that. They both write massive novels about the society of their times, and they're both uh, driven, I think, uh, to to go beyond the real to other things uh, and spiritual questions. But, you know, I once saw an adaptation of Pere Goyo for BBC television. And I said, and, and it was terrible. And I said, aha, that's the difference between Dickens and Balzac. <laughs> it was very hard to analyze and lay your fingers on. But Dickens' world is full of kind of good humor and, and, and caricature. A lot of the minor characters are completely caricatural. And you generally have a narrator who, um, uh, though he can be satiric and savage at times, has this kind of imperturbable good humor about it and, and, and creates a relationship to the reader, which is one of uh, sort of ur urbanity and, and, and amusement. Uh, whereas Balzac is much more much more ferocious um, in his understanding of society. And of course, as Balzac says about uh, Walter Scott, whom he admired very much, the trouble with Scott is that he lived in Puritan England and he couldn't talk about sex. And Balzac, <laughs> Balzac is full of sex. I mean, sex drives his world and um, in a way that it doesn't in Dickens, or not overtly in Dickens. Not overtly, yeah. yes, yes. Um, Somebody uh, asks, is there a painter, poet, composer you find to be a parallel to Balzac since we're comparing, you know, Balzac and Dickens? And that's a tough question. Um, yeah, well, uh, yeah. I'll start with Balzac's own self identifications. I mean, he, he dedicated uh, The Girl with the Golden Eyes to uh, Delacroix. And certainly in the, the, the ghastly last scene of that story where uh, Paquita is murdered and is lying in a pool of blood in her boudoir, which is decorated in, in uh, gold, red and white, as I remember, um, he's trying to do something pictorially that's a little bit like uh, uh, Delacroix, like the death of Sardanapalus, for instance, that great orgy <laughs> or, of death. Mm -hmm. And then um, he, he dedicated, if I'm not mistaken, the Duchess of Langer de France Liszt. Um, so there is um, uh, a composer uh, whom he knew, a uh, composer musician and uh, admired very much and uh, stages in a sense in the novel uh, Beatrix, Beatrice. Um, he, spent a, he spent a long weekend with Georges Sand um, in a country place and uh, sort of got a lot of uh, inside information on uh, her affair with Chopin, for instance, and Liszt's affair with uh, Marie Dagou. So um, he, he was very close to those people. Are they analogous to him? Um, I'm not entirely sure. And as for, as for poetry, um, Certainly there's some of, of Victor Hugo, which is very close to, to Balzac in its grandiosity for one thing. Yes, so um, another um, attendee would like you to talk a bit more about Balzac's influence on Henry James, which ah, is, of course, yeah, no, that's, that's, it's, you know in and out. Uh, it's kind of unexpected to a lot of people. They think of Henry James as in, the, in, in a British tradition along with J Jane Austen and, and George Eliot. But Balzac was absolutely the most important author to James, and he started reading him when he was a child. James, of course, had this crazy family that kept going off to, to Europe, and so he spent a lot of time in France as, as, a, as a boy, and his French was perfect. Um, and he, he, he talks about Balzac over and over again. It is, you know, an essay uh, from early in his career in French poets and novelists in the 1850s, I, I believe, but then he comes back to him over and over again in other essays. There's, uh, when, when he came back um, to the United States after his long exile in, in England, um, he traveled the country going to places 
that you wouldn't necessarily expect. I mean, not, not only a Boston and New York, but Cincinnati and St. Louis and even San Francisco. He traveled across the country by train. And everywhere he went, he, he gave this lecture called The Lesson of Balzac, um, which is one of the best things ever written on Balzac. And it, it, it is about how anyone who pretends to be a novelist has to learn from Balzac, because Balzac understands representation, a very important word for James, a very charged word, um, better than anyone else. Um, just imagine James in Cincinnati or San Francisco uh, giving this, this extended lecture on Henry James, uh, on Balzac. It's kind of crazy. Um, there were mainly, by the way, it turns out women's clubs that invited him to lecture. So the, the, the women in the family, at least, were still reading Balzac in, in 1905. Well, um, we have a question from Emily Apter, which is uh, much more sobering. Oh. Uh, could you talk more about Balzac's election novel and venture parallels with the today? Yeah, no, well, that's why I started, I started writing a paper on it for the 19th century French studies conference, which was supposed to be meeting this October, just before the election, but of course had to be called off because of the pandemic. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting novel. As I said, it's, it's never been finished and it takes place in a small town and typically Balzacian, there are all these different interests. There's Guiguet, who's the rising bourgeois who wants to be elected, whereas the seat traditionally belongs to the Keller clan and the son of the Keller clan is supposed to inherit this, the uh, seat from his father. But then young Keller is, and this is significant too, is killed in Algeria uh, during the French colonial um, uh, uh, expedition in Algeria. We're, some, we're somewhere in the 19, early 1940s, uh, 1840s. I'm not sure. He never specifies quite the, what the date is. And then there is the, the um, group around the chateau, around uh, the saint Signe family um, that has its own interests. And then finally, um, to straighten things out, Maxime de Trailles, who is a rather uh, strange figure, you know, who has a foot in the underworld as well as a foot in high society, is uh, sent by the Salon of Madame d'Espard in the Faubourg Saint-Germain down to uh, Alcise to stand for election. And presumably when the novel ends, he's the guy who's gonna get elected because he has all the corrupt influences behind him. It is a picture of just total corruption, of course, um, which sounds very familiar to us today. And, and of, of hidden forces which are driving this election. Balzac was not a great believer in elections. Oh, yeah, I hope that. So when we that was question. <laughs> yeah, we deplore, you know, that the decadence of our democracies today. But I think it was there, uh, you know, early on in this uh, least bad of all regimes. Absolutely. So, um, well, um, I think um, I don't know if you would like to answer any more questions or. Sure, I'm I, 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 happy to take one or two more. I, I think uh, Francine wants this to end fairly soon, but uh, happy to go on for a while. Okay. Um, so I have a, a personal question, I mean, which is here, uh, about you as a novelist, have you been inspired by Balzac when you wrote your novels? Not, not so much. I mean, I find I found it um, difficult to. Uh, I would find it difficult to transpose his style and manner uh, into the contemporary novel. In fact, uh, I mean, not many people have read my novels, but the second of my novels, uh, *The Emperor's Body*, contains uh, a character named Henri Bell. Um, that is uh, Stendhal, and he is one of the people uh, whose consciousness I enter. Uh, a fairly daring thing to do, I thought, but um, it's fun to be in uh, Stendhal's consciousness because he was such a, a witty, um, um, 
interesting man. You know, I would love to have dinner with Stendhal, uh, with Henri Bell. I'm not sure I'd love to have dinner with, with Balzac. It would be quite a savage spectacle uh, mm -hmm. uh, with food all over the place. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I think Balzac is too much of a kind of monstre sacré to try and be influenced by him in my writing, but certainly James was. And uh, early James, you know, is a very Balzacian and melodramatic. Um, mm -hmm. Well, uh, recently um, a book came out with uh, Garnier, uh, edited by uh, Chantal Massol called uh, Balzac Contemporain. And it deals with all the people who've been influenced by Balzac recently, and among them you have uh, Pierre Michon, and you have François Bon, and you have uh, Michel Houellebecq, mm -hmm. um, uh, and you have Zebalt, of course, you know, in uh, Austerlitz, uh, where you have a, a character from uh, Les Chouans by Balzac, and, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the Chinese author Dai C.J. in uh, in French, Balzac et la petite uh, tailleuse chinoise, a oui. copy has been made on it. Um, so, uh, which is actually filmed not at all in China, but in southern France. Right. So, uh, yes, Balzac is, is out there. And, uh, and I do hope that your Balzac's lives will be read, you know, in many, many places, also in many languages. Uh, so I would like to, at this point, to thank everybody, you, Peter Brooks, of course, for, uh, you know, this very enriching uh, uh, evening, and all our attendees, uh, you know, invisible, but present, and before uh, separating, I would like to um, mention that the, the event will be recorded on in, in the next week, um, not immediately, on the YouTube channel of La Maison Française of NYU. So if you want to replay it or recommend it to friends, it will be there. And also please uh, look at our website for our upcoming programs. They are very interesting. They cover from literature to philosophy to current events. And just to give you a little foretaste, uh, this uh, week and next week, we will have the philosopher series organized by François Moudelman, um, who will receive Yves Citon on October 22nd and uh, Florence Burga on October 29th. So I would like again to thank all of you uh, and to wish everybody a bonne soirée or perhaps overseas a bonne nuit. Thank you, Claudie. Thank you, Francine. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.